Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Today, Ed, we're going to go to Tibet with Tintin. But first, we're going to plug our own stuff. Yes, we are, man. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Serializing the Red Room comics before they see an actual street date in the comic shops. Uh, every Tuesday, new pages go live. It was a three-page week this past week because I finished... Issue four. Look at that, man. You want that on your Tintin video, right? That is a masterpiece of gore. <laughs> so uh, three bucks gets you the archive. I'm serializing all the comics up there before they hit the streets for the early adopters, the True Blue Eddie P fans. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. My latest book, Octobriana 1976, is in comic shops now. It is a black light comic printed with fluorescent ink and uh, selling fast. We are almost out of our print run. We did not print enough of these, apparently, so if you want to add a very weird and unique comic to your collection, pick it up as soon as you see it uh, in comic shops now. And we did send a couple of variants out to comic shops. This is a retro color edition that looks like it was maybe printed in 1976, and a black and white edition, which looks like it came out of 1986. been a long time had the channel for almost two years man had no air on on the channel yet no so glad to rectify that today we're going to look at tintin in tibet uh tintin one of the great uh well-known comic characters worldwide uh internationally and no surprise appears in english as well so um i'm showing this off just because it has been printed in different formats yeah. this is a uh, very kind of a affordable version that collects three albums in one. It's a little bit of a smaller size, but it is a color graphic novel kind of collection. So um, pretty easy to find Tintin. You know, these are in libraries. These are, uh, like I said, reasonably priced editions are available. So um, this is a huge comic. Yeah, you'll find it at, at, at you know, every Barnes and Noble and everything. And this is, in fact, a, a 35th printing of uh, Tintin in, in Tibet from uh, from Little Brown, just to give you some clue as to the popularity of the thing. I discovered Tintin uh, on TV. It was on After Babar, uh, before school, on HBO when I was a little kid. Had no idea that it was a comic. The, f the first time I got any hint that it was a comic was understanding comics. I had no idea there was an animated version that was on American television. Yeah. Uh, small world. Yeah, you know, I don't know how it got on my radar. It's almost like it's always been there. You know, it's it's uh, once you, I got interested in comics, you would hear Tintin and Hergé uh, mentioned. Like I said, one of the, you know, best-known comic characters in the world. Jim, I have to ask you, man. Did you choose this one because you're a fan of the Ohio Grassman? I'm saying <laughs> you dig Bigfoots. I do indeed. I'm saying... There's a, it's a Yeti story. Exactly, and you see it right on the cover. We're not spoiling anything with these giant footprints. That's what we're going to Tibet for, Ed. Yes. We're going in search of Bigfoot. Yeah. So uh, I think of this as maybe contemporary of something like Carl Barks' Duck Comics. And uh, the reason I say that is Barks famous for looking at National Geographics and, and kind of having this adventure-type flavor. Tintin, same thing. Tintin would, uh, you know was an adventure journalist young character that would travel around the world started in the uh in 1929 yeah and uh you know at this point that's pre-television or anything you know if you were wanted to see some exotic locations a comic like this was perfect for it yes in fact the land of the soviets is is the first joint and in the serialized format because what you're reading here is a collection of the serialized let, let me put it a different way the story was serialized in black and white. The art kind of always looked like this in the black and white. It, it wasn't what we think of as Tintin as the album. It's the Hergé studio that puts this together. They re-edit. Um, you know, they do their thing like that. But it was this very like weird looking black and white comic. Even into the 50s, it, it, he, Tintin looked like that in, in the black and white. You can find a really cool art book. I forget the name of it, though, that, that, that shows this stuff off. And it's the Hergé studio that kind of like spearheaded this album format, uh, the, this clean line that is like extremely well-referenced, beautifully drawn. Many hands go into this, even though the RJ name is the name that you see on this because the, co the company even um, did other characters of, you know, there's like a brunette brother and sister, then it just looks the same, you know? Right. The problem, the serialization is the challenge of reading a, a Tintin album to me. Like, 
I was good for about 10 pages a night. And then I was exhausted. Um, I was thinking about, there's a, there's a great um, two minute video with the South Park dudes going to a college and they talk about like the, the construction of their stories. It's all about, um, but, and therefore statements, this happens, but this happens, therefore this happens. And we avoid, and then, and then, and then, if you say, and this is all, and then. Yeah. I, I, I thought of that too, reading through this ed. This is another example of, I think, age and time. So this particular story, I believe, was serialized in like 58, 59, yes. sometime around then. And, and it was serialized in a, like a young adult, like a youth magazine. So clearly it was aimed at younger readers, uh, part, of, part of Tintin's character, which is very neutral, um, you know, so that the readers could easily identify with Tintin in these uh, exotic places where he traveled and the adventures that he had. But I think that kind of storytelling, that and then, and then, I think some of that is is a byproduct of aimed at a young reader and at a time, you know, late 50s. I mean, you know, this would have been 30s, 40s, 50s, whenever this stuff is being made. And I think that the storytelling, that was just more of the time. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, I like, because I wonder if just there's like a, a cultural piece to, to like what youths would accept in Franco-Belgian areas uh compared to america because Karl Barks doesn't read this way really and and it was it was a, around the, the same time it was it was more poppy and, and it had and had more consequence the third element may be that serialization yeah you know when you read like collected newspaper strips they have a different re- rhythm obviously than like a comic published in the comic book format yeah they do um so so like reading these tintes like exhaustion is the best term I could come up with to, to the reading experience, uh, because it it really is, it's, it's like all kind of info dump and things happen with very little consequence in a lot of ways. It's like, they're going from point A to point B. You're going to see things along the way, but to remind you that we're going to, you know, Kathmandu or something, you're going to eat a weird piece of fruit that is only found there or some shit like that. (laughs) Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. (laughs) Um, so the story is that, that they're in Nepal and, Tintin has almost a vision of his friend Chang, yeah, who you know comes to him in a dream kind of state, and it's afterwards that they find out that Chang has died in a plane accident, and Tintin doesn't think he died because of this very vivid dream, and so he is on a quest to go to the find the plane crash and find his friend who he believes is still alive, despite everybody telling him that's not the case. And by the way, is, was alcohol different in the fifties? Because <laughs> because everybody's drinking a couple drops and are hallucinating yeah, mad hallucinations it, it, it was all absinthe or something that's a good point i didn't even think about that too much but captain haddock one of the uh main characters in tintin is has packed a bunch of whiskey along and uh, a little bit of it's dripping out to snowy the dog so we've seen captain haddock have his like hallucinate hallucinogenic reactions to the alcohol earlier and now we're having Snowy uh, with the same effects as he's following along and drinking this this alcohol out of the broken, dripping bottle. Illustration-wise, and you could just keep keep flipping, uh, one of my great takeaways when I look at Hergé comics is um, you, you don't... If you choose the right lines, you don't need to draw the entire, like, dark side of a mountain or something. You know, it's just, like, these simple shapes, like tell enough of the story and and like when i am in a pinch and with the x-men comics uh when i'm going to savage land and stuff i was looking at things like this to just try to figure out like how to get interesting looking like foliage textures and junk yeah you mentioned clean line at the at the top of the show ed that's you know that's the style that's what this is called and it is uh very different than certainly like marvel dc house styles that i grew up reading uh, and it is kind of revelatory. You know, it's it's amazing drawing. I, I remember reading speculation that the air quality of Europe contributed to this style developing because it was cleaner air and clearer, you know, you could see more clearly. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it is a very different approach. Uh, interesting that it's serialized in black and white originally yeah. because the color is so important, you know, without having those spotted blacks, uh, Haddock's beard and, and pants notwithstanding, um, the color really helps. When you see the characters in their full, full f- bodies, the, like the full figured images, the weight distribution of w- how these characters stand and move 
is also so perfect. Like, like you, when you have this clean line style, you can't hide things in black and shadow. Very true. And make note of that as you see, like, these are like exquisitely drawn yes. figures. Yeah, extraordinary for sure. And then whenever you do get to see like a bigger image, you know, it's used sparingly, these big panels, but when you see it, it is always spectacular drawing. Yeah. But it is great characters, as you say, Ed. Weight, acting, gesture, all of those things are top notch. Yeah, and, and it's like you see you get a little character with a polka dot face or something, but then when you see this, it's like that looks like reference from a human being. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um, I love that there's snowstorms in here. We've talked about that in other videos, and I love seeing like artists do snow. For some reason, that's that's a very graphic element in comics that works. There's there's like snowstorms are interesting. One of the things that I like to see cartoonists do, just like you know the hip hop family tree guy, is nobody draws vinyl record albums the same way. Like everybody has their own version of like what a vinyl record looks like in in black and white ink. It's funny you say that because now they're in the plane wreckage and it reminds me almost of like the EC kind of Wally Wood. Yeah. St I mean, totally a different version of it, but that was the first thing I thought of. And, uh... it, no, this would have been like two pages a clip, like every week or something like that. So it's all these like, put the character in peril on, on uh, like have the character get out of peril one page put him in peril the next. So that's where we get the and then, and then, and then stuff where as an exercise, it's probably not easy to do to like create. There are Tintin albums where, you know, count the amount of times he gets knocked on the head and, and <laughs> rendered unconscious, you know, but, uh, pre -C CTE information. <laughs> oh dude. Like he, like he, like he, you know, keep him away from any heavy machinery or weaponry. I want to point out, you know, there's a great example of like the weight stuff. Yeah. Uh, as they're trying to hold on to their buddy who's fallen into this crevasse. But uh, I think these were serialized. I believe they were printed at like half a sheet per page mm -hmm. and, and maybe several pages. I don't know how many pages were, but I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that it'd be like a half a page is the way they were printed. Here's the thing that's crazy. Like Tintin went through serial serialization in many different publications, including like some like Nazi fucking publications wow you know i mean the strip is old enough that uh that it was around in those times where you know it was maybe serialized in places that were unsavory at 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 my most generous yeah for sure uh uses all the comic language too the yeah. stuff that you know again some some comics veer away from but uh we see lots of stars after those uh head traumas <laughs> that, that you mentioned and things like, you know, binocular views, right? You know, the point of view of a character, but, but using those visual devices. The color sets the scene a, a, a lot of times D at the different locales. Um, you know, you, you soften the focus of your eyes. You, you, like you could, you could, you could see a different, different palettes than in other parts of, of the story. The rock climbing sequences is a great example of the whole weight part and, and his ability to kind of convey heaviness and weight and pooling and all of this stuff is just you said exquisite, I think, Ed? Yes. Yeah. Very, very much so. Uh, use of things like panel shape. You know, these pages, they're, they're relatively static. We, we've looked at lots of manga where stuff is just crazy dynamic, but he still gets use out of those, you know, using shapes of panels for uh, dramatic effect. I'm not a fan of the lettering. The lettering, uh, glad you mentioned that. I have a note on the lettering. The English lettering is done by a cartographer, uh, Neil Hyslop, and that begins in 1958 until 2000s. This original U.S. edition was 1975, so I believe this is his lettering. Mm -hmm. And then in the 2000s, at some point, it's all replaced by fonts. And uh, I don't know if they're based on this kind of lettering style or if it's a different font altogether. I bet your book is the font book. It's not. No. It's the same as this. So, you know, like you still have... it's. Very neat. Uh, you know, you could, I could imagine a font that looks pretty close to this if they went that direction. This, this to me, it's the argument for all caps uh, when, when, when you give your... Because you have to spend a little more time. I, I have to spend a little more time reading the balloons than I probably would have had to if it was like a Barks book or something. I always hated whenever... I think Marvel switched to more of this stuff at some point, like uh, post-Joe Quesada. Yeah. And uh, I always hated it. Just didn't look like comics lettering to me. You know, I, I wanted the uh, all caps too. And see, new, new, new scene, new color palettes. 
Yeah. You know, so it's it's using every every sort of aspect of the 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 formal process that they could think of to uh to get to get their story across yeah and they have struggled this has been a very hard expedition which i like that part you know like i've seen read books about mountaineering and you know you see documentaries about everest climbs that go wrong they do really well like like air has all that stuff they get caught in a storm on the side of the mountain they fall into into crevices in the mountain like all the stuff that you would come across in these stories whether they're novels or, or documentaries all of it's in here, which does add to drama. It's where he's, you know, I think it's where most of the drama comes. And then if that's not enough, you do, you do get to see the Yeti. The Ohio grass man made it to the Himalayas. And they track that, you know, like, like they're, that's built early on whenever the, uh, the Sherpas are warning them about, you know, the, the presence of the Yeti and the dangers of the Yeti, you know, like you get a little bit of foreshadowing and, and this idea that this is not going to be good if you run into this character. And of course they do. But also they run into Chang. So he, Tintin's friend is still alive, uh, thankfully. And he does rescue him, but not without running into, uh, into the, the Bigfoot. <laughs> One out of ten, Jim. Uh, how do you give, give that Yeti a grade? <laughs> it's a lot better if you do this. <laughs> That's about a nine right there. Hamburger. Yeah. You lose a couple. You lose a couple <laughs> points there, but... Eh, what are you gonna do? He's big. He's kind of scary. Makes short work of Captain Haddock. So at least you see the uh, the effects of of this beast. As a as a cartoonist, Hergé was never not working. He ran a company in a studio full of, you know, he was responsible for employing people. Never took a day off. Uh, all the Tintin stories are these expansive, traveling tales, coming from the pen of a guy who never left the studio. That's interesting. wonder where he's getting all his uh, morgue file materials. A lot, a lot of, uh, you know, whatever the Franco-Belgian version of National Geographic is. Yeah, and I mean, you know, there, there's a reason that, like, explorers and adventurers were such a thing in the early 20th century, because how else would you see any of this stuff or hear about any of these places? And it makes sense that you'd then put it into a, uh, into a comic strip and sell it to kids. And that's a lot of what Tintin is, right? It's these these exotic travel books the the adventures that maybe adult tr adventurers would have uh let's see how we can sell that to kids and why not man that's that's great for uh, excitement and, and seeing some different stuff i think it's really astute the color palette changes from scene to scene he does you know and, and this is 30 years in so like he knew the formula at this point and you get all of it it's it's show off the food show off the clothes show off all the different locations and the colors that go with that and uh and why not you know, it looks great, and I can see kids loving this. Oh yeah, and if for for myself, drawing wise, I, I get I get so much out of it. It's and there's always and there's drawing. always a good couple of scenes in there. You know, like they talk about like you know, great movies you need like like eight good scenes. Tintin albums never have like eight good scenes, but they'll have like three. Yeah, a couple of good set pieces here. The airplane crash, one of the great set pieces that they visit a couple of times, daytime, nighttime. Yeah. Um, I wonder, time-wise, that seems to be an element that is, it's extremely linear, the time. You know, there, there's, that may be part of the reason we don't get more drama, is because it does feel like this is very straightforward right. in that regard. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then. And then we see this, and then we go there, and then we go there, and then this happens. The Dalai Lama awarded this the Light of Truth Award in 2006, citing it as um, maybe the first time a lot of people saw the tibetan land and landscape and uh, some of their culture that's a pretty big honor yeah yeah in 2006 <laughs> it is funny it, ha it happened 40, so much years so after. much later but what are you gonna do <laughs> get out of here jim that's all i have K favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when the next videos are available uh, octobriana is in stores right now selling out fast selling like hotcakes that thing is going to be worth a lot of money on ebay in a couple of weeks maybe <laughs> let's hope <laughs> patreon.com slash ed piscor where i'm serializing the red room comic strips new pages every tuesday you can subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video you can find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video and ed i'd be remiss if i didn't mention this little brown is the publisher of tintin here in the u.s also the publisher of my book the plain jane so i'm in good company why don't you letter these, man? <laughs> <laughs> Give them the marching orders, dude. Read more comics.